uh, you get the same message all through the Bible, don't you? Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ is the message. He's the glory of God. Romans chapter number 1, titled the message, Separated unto the Gospel of God. Separated unto the Gospel of God. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, the theme is the gospel of God. The Bible does say in Romans chapter number 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that is therein, within the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. From faith to faith, that means here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept, line upon line. You get one truth after another. One truth after another till that whole, and I've used this before, and I hope that uh, you don't think I'm uh, disrespecting the Word of God, but it's, it's kind of like putting together a thousand-piece puzzle. You, you, you get that last piece in there, and you sit back, and I see it, you know, I see it. So that faith to faith is all that truth that comes together and that paints a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is and the work that He accomplished on Calvary's cross to satisfy Almighty God. Amen. Now, uh, take your Bibles, if you will. Let's go to, I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 1, but go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. This good news, the gospel means good news. This good news originated in the love of the Father and the truth, the truth centers in His Son. That gospel is good news. And by the way, the gospel is good news. It's not good advice. It's good news. Amen. It's good news. The Bible said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, verse number, uh, oh, look here at verse number 8 and 9. No, look at verse 2. First. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, then verse 8 and 9. The Bible said, But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And if you'll notice in verse number 8 and 9 uh, of 1 Thessalonians 2, the Bible said, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Verse 9, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God, separated to the gospel of God. The Bible says in verse 13, Now, uh, if the gospel does not come from above, and being from God, it's from above. If it doesn't come from above, it's not good news at all. Amen? In verse number 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're to receive it as from above. The Bible said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Um, verse number 13 is a very important verse. Um, uh, the whole Bible is important. But I, Brother Archer said something. With, if the Lord uh, constantly uh, uses repetition on a certain subject, then it must be pretty important. We need to preach on a little bit more, don't we? The Bible says right here, those that believe, that the Word of God effectually worketh in you that believes, that believes. I said something last week, I don't know if it, um, if it offended some folk or not, or they disagreed with what, but this matter of Calvinism, I detest the gospel of Calvinism. I detest what they preach. I, I detest it. Uh, it. It is heresy. They're giving a select few, a select opportunity. Amen. And uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, whether you believe or not, because if you're one of the frozen chosen, then you're going to believe, and, and that's all it is. Well, see, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It's effectually worketh in those that believe. Jesus Christ died to save sinners. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
Well, and how in the world can they take that verse and twist it? But they do, and they said that's just the elect world. Where does it say the elect world? Did you know according to Hebrews, the whole world's elected? The whole world has been elected to believe the gospel. While you're in Thessalonians, I can't pass up 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as well. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, not 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. The Bible said that we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and what? Belief of the truth. You see, we believe in the sovereignty of God more than the Calvinists. I believe that God is able to let man have their own way and still be in control. That's pretty sovereign, isn't it? Amen. That's pretty sovereign. God's God. So Romans chapter number one, the theme is the gospel of God, the gospel of God. The truth has been announced as well. If you'll notice in verse two, the Bible said, talking about the, he, Paul separated to the gospel of God. I believe that happened. Um, and he wasn't chosen as far as uh, uh, when he had uh, no knowledge, Paul had to make a choice. And if you'll notice in Acts chapter number nine, verse 15, I believe this is, uh, concerning Paul being separated to the gospel of God. Acts chapter number 9, verse 15. The Bible said, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is chosen vessel unto me to do what? To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul on the road to Damascus, a light came down from heaven and a voice spoke. And Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? Paul made a choice to believe Christ. God had caused circumstances to come in his life with uh, Stephen and some others and the attitude of Christians that Paul could not get over the goodness of Christ. He could not get over the convicting Holy Spirit and that trip on the road to Damascus, Paul was never the same. He was separated unto the gospel of God. And in verse number two of Romans chapter number one, this gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This gospel of God is the same in the Old Testament that it is in the New Testament. The only difference in the Old Testament, if there is a difference, is that he was pointing to Calvary and to Messiah. In the New Testament, we're looking back on what he's already done. All the Old Testament prophets had it down pat. They knew Messiah. They knew he was coming. They knew he was going to die for the sins of the world. He's that prophet, Moses said, that should come. He is prophesied in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, is that enmity that was going to be between the woman's seed and the seed of the devil. It's all in the Bible, all the way through the scriptures. Unto you a child is born, a son is given. In the book of Isaiah, a virgin will conceive on and on and on and on and on. Christ Jesus, God became man to go to Calvary. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come and buy without money, without price. You make a choice in the Old Testament. You make a choice in the New Testament to receive this wonderful good news. The gospel power, the dynamite of God, the spirit of God working in your life that can transform a lost sinner to a saint. Hallelujah wonderful gospel. We keep preaching that gospel. The truth has been announced in the Old Testament on and on. We could go back to Genesis and start preaching and find Christ everywhere in the Old Testament. Amen. And then in verse number three, the, the gospel, the Bible says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. In verse number three, we see this gospel of God concerns his Son, God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's two ways in which it concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, His person, and secondly, His work. We said that the theme of Romans is the gospel, but the theme of the gospel is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is the theme of the God. He is the gospel. He is righteousness. He is wisdom. He is sanctification. He is glorification. He's everything we need. He's everything you need here today. Not only for salvation of the soul, but to help you through life as you encounter difficulties and problems and joys and triumphs and everything. There's Christ who you need. And then, of course, we at the end of our road, we have him as well. We don't need to sorrow as one that has no hope. Why? Because we have the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about our loved ones if they've trusted Christ. 
I remember my mother laying in the coffin and you say, well, you shouldn't talk about it. It just resurrects memories, you know, and things like that. But it, I, I look at my mama and I say, thank God, I'll see you again. I'll see you again. I don't sorrow as others which have no hope. Oh, you hurt. You hurt when you lose a loved one, but you don't have to sorrow as one that has no hope. Why? Because I have a place reserved in heaven. And it's kept by the power of God. I don't even have to worry about keeping it. We're about being good. It's God in you that's good. And He seals you until the day of that bodily redemption. This is a wonderful gospel that you hear every Sunday. You hear it in Sunday school. Wonderful presentation. You hear it every time. Every time, every morning in Bible study, you'll hear something about it. You'll hear, you'll always hear it in a message here at Faith Baptist Church. Why should we always preach it? Because there's people here that's lost. I've had people right here say, thank you for preaching. You remember, you remember that little lady. What's her name? Jean Reichard. Jean Reichard. Feisty little woman. I hope she's watching. She's up in Birmingham right now. She reminded me of Granny Clampett. Yeah, yeah, she did. She, you know, you know the way she carried herself, don't you? you know, remember? She stopped me back there on the back one time. I was shaking hands and she said, is it? She said, is that all you know how to preach? I just looked at her and smiled. And I said, no, ma'am. And that's all I said. She kept going. She came back to me after she got saved some months later at 89 years old. She said, do you remember me asking you that question? I said, oh, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, I'm glad you kept on preaching. Amen. Somebody here needs Christ. Somebody needs Christ. Jesus, there's two ways it concerns His person and His work. The gospel consists in the definition of who He is. Who He is. God became man. The Bible told, tells us in the book of John chapter 4, as uh, speaking to the woman at the well, Christ was speaking, if you knew who it was, and the gift you would have asked, and I would have given you the water of life freely. So it's important that you know who He is. How in the world can you trust anyone that you don't know anything about? So we find everything we need to know about Christ in the very Word of God. Uh, so the Gospel consists in the definition of who He is and in the setting forth of what He has done. What He has done. Done. Now, he's still doing things today as our high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father in the heavens, in the right hand of the majesty on high. But what he has done concerning your soul salvation. So it's not begging God at the end of the service to do something. It's believing what he has done is sufficient to get you to heaven. If you cannot trust the sufficiency of Christ, you're going to miss salvation. God satisfied the very demands of a holy God. He reconciled the world. That means He brought the world together. He removed the enmity that was between you and God. He took the handwriting of ordinances, took them out of the way, nailed them to His cross. You can come boldly before the throne of grace right now to find mercy and grace in the time of need. Why? Because of Christ already has shed His blood already made reconciliation, already has made peace. Why can't you simply believe it? To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Believing and receiving in that one verse is clear. It's synonymous. When you receive, of course you believe. They receive. So you don't go through a plan and say, well, first of all, you got to believe, and second of all, you got to receive. No, when you receive Christ, you believe Him. And you say, well, do you preach repentance over there at the Faith Baptist Church? How, how, how can you not see that you had to change your mind to believe? Huh? How, can, how can you not see that? How, how, so that's, that's what repentance is. It's, it's to change a change of thought. It's a word metanoia, which means a change of thought. I see that I can't do it. He did it. And I accept what he did. Therefore, you've changed your mind. I've changed my mind. All right. So, amen, amen, brother. So uh, anyway, suppose for a moment, suppose for a moment now, that a man owed an impossible large debt at a bank. That's, that might be familiar to some of us. I don't know. Just suppose for a moment a man owed a large impossible debt at a bank. And another man, his friend, walks in and says to the bank official, 
I want to be responsible for that debt. But the friend is as bankrupt as the debtor. The gesture is meaningless. Good intentions, but meaningless. Good intentions. There's a lot of folks sitting in pews today have good intentions. But if you're not careful, it can be meaningless. Meaningless. Oh, I have good intentions. I have good intentions. I could make a whole sermon out of good intentions. But it's meaningless. Christ is the key. Christ is the meaningful key uh, that you need. You need Christ. Salvation is Christ. Now, the value of what he promised in this particular story, the value of what he promises to do depends entirely upon his position and worth. Now, think about that. He didn't qualify, but there's one that we know. He is deity. Christ is deity. And he has inexhaustible riches. And he said he paid your sin debt. And he said, I'm capable of doing it. Only God can forgive sin. So we know that Jesus Christ is deity. And for you that don't know what de de you know, we use, we use that word deity. It simply means he's God. It simply means, if you'll notice in Romans chapter number 1 verse 20, the Bible said, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Godhead. Godhead is deity. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians chapter 2. So if we use the word Trinity and we use the word deity, you say, well, I can't find those words in the King James Bible. My dear friend, you can find Godhead. It means the same thing. He is God. Jesus is God. Not less than God. God made flesh. There was a lady down in North Chattanooga one time that says there's no way I can believe in Christ. Why can't you believe in Christ? Because I do not believe that a virgin can have a child. I said, my, my. You believe in this big mud ball we're walking on, all the planets and stars. I said, you can believe all that. But you can't believe that God could overshadow Mary and, and within Mary's womb put a seed and the Lord Jesus be born a, of a virgin. And by the way, in order to forgive sins, he has to be God and he has to be without sin. That's why God overshadowed Mary. Jesus did not have that, 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 that earthly human uh, father. He, he had his heavenly father. Now he had a stepfather named Joseph. But therefore, the, seed, the, uh, the sin did not come through the seed of man and Jesus was born without sin. Give me a verse on that, Romans 5.12. Wherefore is by what? One man. Sin entered into the world and death by sin so that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So sin, the sin nature comes through your father and everyone have sin, has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't think you're above it. I was talking to a young man not too long ago that says he's always been a Christian. I said, rethink that statement, please. You may, have all, you may have always been brought up in church and always been brought up in a godly family, but you haven't always been a Christian. And you can go to, to John chapter number 8, and the Jews said the same thing. We're born of our father Abraham. Just because you were born of Christian parents does not mean you're saved. You're going to have to make a choice when you get to a certain age where you can think and, and, and know good and evil. You're going to have to make that choice of Christ or not. And God will never violate your free will, my dear friend. He won't violate your free will. You're going to make a choice. Why, why does man have to make a choice? Let me tell you why man has to make a choice. Because God does not want a bunch of puppet on strings. He does not want that. What God wants you to do is to love Him because of who He is and what He's done for you. Of your own volition. So that separates us from that Calvinistic doctrine. Amen. So a, the, the, the value of what he promises to do is depend upon his, depends upon his position and his worth. So a mere man nor an angel could ever come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
And you'll find that verse in Luke 19, verse 10. Their gesture would be meaningless, but only the Son of God, God in human flesh, could be wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities. You and I are blemished. Jesus Christ is the Lamb without blemish. blemish. Ninety-four times in the Bible uh, concerning uh, this, this uh, sac concerning a sacrifice of a lamb without blemish. Only one time in the Bible is that without blemish used concerning the church, and that's Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 27. When Jesus came forth with his, with his unquestionable supernatural power, they turned to him immediately with questions concerning his identity. They did the same thing, by the way, with John the Baptist. But where John confessed that he was not the Christ, Jesus confessed that he was. He was the Christ. All boldly he confessed it. Uh, I, had a, I had some, uh, some people of a different persuasion one time come to my house, knock on my door, and, and uh, begin to talk to me. And, and so I, I, I entertained them just a little bit. And, and uh, I said, now it's my turn to ask you a question. I started talking to them. And anyway... He says, nowhere, and I've told you this before, but it just I can see it in my mind. There was two of them. And he, they said, nowhere in your Bible does it say that Jesus Christ is God. And I said, how much time do you have? Amen. How much time, how much time do you have? Let, let's go. And went over. And they were bum fuzzled. There were some people right over here where I live now in the parsonage. They come over there to the carport. And uh, they begin to talk, and they they wanted to they wanted to sell you on this uh, uh, genealogy thing. You know, you where you come from. I don't know where I came from. I mean, you know, I mean, all, probably all my own was convicts come over from England. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. But they kept, you know, wanting. That, you know what crowd it is out of Salt Lake City. And uh, nevertheless, they uh, they wanted to do my genealogy. I said. It was two ladies. I said, ma'am, I have got some wonderful news. I can go back to a point, and this is as far as I want to go. I said, I said, I, listen, I'm part of the family of Abraham. And they were, they, they question mark eyes, you know. And I started explaining how that you can walk by the steps of that faith, and you can be part of the family of Abraham. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful spiritually? Spiritually descendant of Abraham, I'm in the royal family, and and they again, I'm I'm not exaggerating. Uh, that 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 what what been nice talking to you. <laughs> never been back. Ne never been back. But I got them to think. I hope. I pray. I did. I pray that they are thinking about those those words that I told them that Jesus Christ is in the seed of Abraham. And because of Jesus Christ, I'm included in the royal family. And you can be too. And let me tell you something. In the royal family, God doesn't make any junk. You're special in God's eyes. So you keep on. All right. So nevertheless, Jesus claimed to be God. The Bible's never afraid to put the twin truths of humanity and deity of Christ in the same verse. In Romans chapter number 1, verse number 3 and 4, Jesus was both made and declare. Jesus was and is the God-man. In Him is absolute humanity and absolute deity. We say today again the divinity of Christ or the deity of Christ. We're talking about the Godhead, the eternal Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the lessons in the storm in Luke chapter number 8, we see His humanity and we see His deity. We see he was so much man in Luke chapter number 8 that he was tired and he went to sleep in the boat, but he was so much God that he stood up and commanded the elements of the universe to sit down and shut up. That's who he is. That's who he is. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 27, we see the tribute money. That You remember, uh, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Peter said, I need something to pay. He said, are we required to pay? Deity, Jesus said, Go and the first fish you get, there's going to be a coin in its mouth. Amen? And so we see his humanity in that he allowed Peter to pay taxes on that. So people that, that are really... Uh, anyway, that's a whole other subject about taxes and so forth. Pay your taxes. 
All right, so in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 to 15, we see the first promise of a Redeemer. We see that uh, Jesus Christ is totally God, totally man. He's going to be born of a virgin. In Isaiah chapter, well, the fact is, it'd, be, it'd help you to turn over there. Go to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter number 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean according to Matthew? God with us. This is Bible now. God with us. Look at verse 6 of chapter 9 of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, capital W, Counselor, capital C, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, you see in verse number um, uh, 6 right here of Isaiah chapter number 9, a child is born, that's his humanity. And then we see a son, capital S, is given. That's his divinity. So we see a child is born, a son is given. In uh, Galatians chapter number 4, in verse number 4, God sent. That's divinity made under the law. That's his humanity. So we go all the way through the scripture, and the scripture harmonizes on the God-man the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter number 1, verse 3 and 4, we look at that word made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse number 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Made is, hum is his humanity, declared is his divinity. This is the Christ of the Bible. And my dear friend, there is no other Jesus that we pray to or pay homage to or worship. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. There is no other Jesus. There's only one Jesus of the Bible. He's a Jesus who paid your sin debt, who rose again, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection, rose again for your justification. He's the one that shed His blood. He's the one that satisfied Almighty God. He's the one that saves by grace. He is the one that keeps you by grace and seals you to the day of bodily redemption. He's the one that promised you a new body one day. This is the Christ that should be preached. Not another. There is not another gospel and there's no other Christ. If you'll take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I hope uh, for those of you listening that's never saw this verse, it'll drive home. Look over at 2, uh, let me get over there. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I, you've read that. I mean, I just quoted it. I fear lest by any means the serpent beguiled Eve. But notice verse number four. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. I hope you get that. There's people out here preaching another Jesus and another gospel. How, is a how are people preaching another Jesus? They're preaching Jesus plus works. Jesus and be good to get there. I've heard there's people that's come to me and said, I, you know, preacher, I believe a little bit what you're preaching. I said, well, at least you're listening. I said, now check it out with the Word of God. He said, but this is what I believe. I believe that you've got to come and, and, and just, just get real sincere. And everybody, everybody ought to be sincere. But you've got to be sincere and you've got to pray through and then you've got to ask God to do something with your sins. And, then after, and that's only from the point now that He forgave sins up to the point you ask Him. Then you've got to ask Him to keep forgiving you and you've got to live right to go to heaven. I, this is, I'm, not, I'm not fabricating this story. 
And I said, why is it, sir or ma'am, that you just can't believe what the Bible has to say? I said, it's, it's the simplicity of the gospel. I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You see, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. It's written twice in the book of Proverbs. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end there over the ways of death. When you start trying to post your self-righteous standards to the refrigerator door and you make your own set of standards instead of receiving God's righteousness who is Christ who exceeds any standards that you could ever come up with you accept him and God said that he would impute to you the righteousness of his dear son and he would seal you to the day of body redemption you mean that's it what more is there to be done? My little granddaughter, I love her with all my heart. Pray for her. She's going to... I love all my grandkids. But uh, little Emily's going to UAW, uh, University of Alabama up in uh, Birmingham. <clears throat> Pray they'll have an answer. But she said something to me. We were just talking about her and I was talking about the gospel. And uh, she said it better than anything I out of the mouth of babes. I said, isn't this a wonderful thing? I said, why won't people believe it? And her answer was, well, why wouldn't they believe it? Why wouldn't they believe it? If this is so good and so real and it'll keep you out of hell, why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe it? Everything necessary has been, been done in Christ. Amen. So we see in our message today the uh, separated to the gospel. Jesus is the legal Messiah, the royal Messiah, the true Messiah, the only possible Messiah. The truth is out. The lines are exhausted. Therefore, any man that ever comes into this world professing to fulfill the conditions will be a liar and a child of the devil. Now, we do know according to John chapter number 5, verse number 43, an attempt will be made to do so. And you know what his name is? Antichrist. Antichrist. What we believe concerning Jesus is not a myth nor a fairy tale, but established on the rock of divine revelation. You that are saved have no problem with Romans chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. We know it. We have within us that new life because of Jesus Christ, the very gospel. Will you trust Him before it's too late? You that do not know, will you trust Him? Stay in the Word of God. I, I preached this one time in a church in Florida, down in middle Florida. Not this same sermon, but I closed the message with, will you trust Him? And one particular fellow got particularly a little irate. He said, so that's all I hear, trust him, trust him. What do you mean, trust him? Well, you know, I thought about that. I thought that I should have explained myself, but I stopped and explained myself. I said, trust in Christ. The word trust is synonymous with the word have faith. It's synonymous with the word believe. It's synonymous with the word receive. It's synonymous with the word rest. Rest. We'll rest in Christ. So it, th these words are interchangeable. So I said, when you trust in Christ, that means absolutely give up any hope of anything you can do and simply rest in the finished work, the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, thank you. So if I didn't explain myself good enough, hopefully I did just now. Rest in the finished work of Christ. Redemption is already been taken care of. Redemption is to purchase. When did Christ redeem the world? When He shed His blood, Colossians 1.20. When He shed His blood, He purchased the world. Just because He redeemed or purchased the world does not mean everyone's saved. People still need to be regenerated. The Bible uses the word in Ephesians 2, quickened. 
You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. When does that happen? It's procured, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It's procured, it becomes yours the moment you believe him. Amen. Let's